It's a pleasure to be here, and I, I want to thank Mike and Ian for the privilege and opportunity to be here with you today. I really enjoyed last evening, and I'm looking forward to meeting some more people and learning, some great people and learning a lot today. Um, just real briefly, my background, um, I graduated from college and I went to work in consulting, and I spent three years doing competitive analysis almost exclusively at a terrific firm with great people. I then took that skill set and got, was really fortunate to go to work for Chuck Royce in the small cap space. I spent a couple years with Chuck and the late Tom Ebright. They were great to me, great people, great investors. And then I was fortunate to, to land at Ruane Kniff and Goldfarb, where I was there for almost a decade, and I was a partner for six years. Um, it was a terrific, uh, terrific place. And so I was there, like I said, for almost a decade, did a ton of field-based work there, as well as with Royce. And then I started, we started our own shop. And we have an office in Wymissing, which is where all my people are, and back office. And I recently moved to New York and have an office and live there now permanently. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I think is really um, unique in this business, and that is many, many people focus on the financial characteristics, and those are really the foundation and the starting point. But the problem is the numbers which are, are really telling you about the past and you're investing in the future. And so with the rapidity and magnitude of change today in companies, in industries, it's just mind-boggling. You really have to find people that can see around corners and look, look to the future and try and gain insights to give you a sense of what's going to happen. And so over the years, I kind of thought one of the neat words that really apply to it are differential insights. You're trying to find what's unique and what's different about a particular company within a particular industry. So I just wanted to give you a brief presentation outline here um, our investment philosophy, you need a foundation to start with. Um, your research process, I'm just going to briefly go through that. And then I'm going to give you five examples, and then I want to open it up for questions. So I'm going to go pretty quickly to get through this stuff. There's the investment philosophy. There's the quick presentation outline. And what we're really trying to do for our clients, we manage all separate accounts. We're really not interested in running mutual funds or hedge funds. Um, we don't like product for two reasons. One, it's often not raised by you, and it comes from third parties, which really, really limits your flexibility. You don't really know the client. You may not have high-quality, quasi-permanent capital. The second reason is you're typically pigeonholed. So if you're a small-cap value guy, you meet with someone, you know, you meet with an endowment, they'll give you whatever, 50 or 100 million, and they pigeonhole you. You can invest in market caps of a billion to five billion or a billion to three. You can only buy value. If you buy growth, they'll fire you. Um, and then they give you the money and give you two weeks to invest it. Well, we don't do anything like that. We typically have clients that have very long-term horizons as we do. And we tell them if they have less than a five-year horizon for the equity portion, um, just don't give us the money. Um, and so we think long term uh, is really the way to think and the quality of the assets you have plays a profound role in what you're able to do with that money. And if the two aren't congruent, you're really going to create a lot of problems for yourself and for the client. And so our goal is really to maximize the long-term after-tax returns for our clients in various economic and market conditions while emphasizing the preservation of capital. And so we run balanced accounts, and they're pretty concentrated. We typically only own 10 to 15 stocks, maybe as many as 20 if there's some smaller cap names. And then we also buy fixed income. Again, the, the rule that everyone's familiar with, we really, really are conservative. We, we hate permanent capital loss. So our focus is never to really lose money. And as Warren Buffett has said, never forget rule number one. We try to focus on a sound analytical framework. I worked for marvelous people, and I learned a lot from them. Bill and Rick and Bob, Greg Alexander, Carly Kniff. Um, sadly, several of them have, are gone now. But I learned an enormous amount, and the thing I, one of the things I learned, one of the many things I learned from all of them is, what's the downside? What can go wrong? How much can I lose? That's really the first question we ask after we've done some of the thinking. The second is risk. We don't view volatility as risk. Risk is permanent capital loss in our mind. 
We're always thinking about the three key components, the business model of the company and the industry in which it competes, the management and the valuation. And we're always thinking about these three issues whenever we're doing the work. We always want the margin of safety. There's the great bridge example. If you're a civil engineer and you're building a bridge, you want it to hold 100,000 pounds, but then you limit it to only 50,000 pound trucks. So even if you're wrong, you're just not gonna get hurt. Same with investing. You're all aware of intrinsic value. And then Mr. Market, never think about the market. In the short run, the market's a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. People often ask us um, about our research process. And um, one of the things that we think really differentiates us is not only having trying to get high quality capital and direct relationships with your clients, we really dream a lot. And I learned a lot of that from Tom Ebright at Royce and Chuck. You know, just conceptualize, dream, be creative, think. We try to really be focused, not only with our holdings and with our clients, we try to apply focus in every area. And so we always think about what's knowable and what's important, as Mr. Buffett would say. Um, there's literally, it's so easy to get mired in all the data. And this business is all about insights and judgment. And if you can really focus on what's knowable and what's important, and then utilize, develop unique insights from the tons and tons of data that's out there, and then have the courage and the ability to exercise sound judgment based on that. So it's really converting the data into real important knowledge and insights. And so we think a lot, we read a lot, the data collection process is secondary. We do an enormous amount of secondary research. We really try to know the companies and the industries in which they compete. We read trade journals. We read all the annuals and 10Ks. We go back many, many years. We read about managements. And after we do all that secondary work, we then begin to focus on the primary research. And we think it's a really, really important component of research and very few people really do it. It's hard, it takes a lot of time, and it's expensive. But one of the reasons, two of the other big reasons that people don't do it, they don't concentrate enough for it to matter, and they don't hold stocks long enough for it to matter. So at Ruane, for example, I spent two years studying Progressive, and we made over $2 billion in it. Um, you're just not going to do that if you don't hold stocks for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if you're turning them over regularly, it's just not worth it. And if it's a very small component of your portfolio, if it's 1%, why would you bother? At Ruane, it was 15% at, at purchase cost. So the, the primary research we, we think is really, really important. And we try to find a network with thought leaders. We prepare for the interview, and then the interviews we think it's really important. A lot of firms hire other firms to get them phone calls with thought leaders. We have found over the years it's a lot more work, but the personal interview is just so much better than doing it on the phone. Um, for example, let's say you call a former CEO and he's living in Naples now and he retired three years ago. The insights he or she may have are extraordinary. We don't really care about next month's earnings, or we just don't care. We want to look out 5 and 10 and 15 years. Well, someone who spent their life in an industry can really give you unique insights that aren't available. They don't even know you when you call them on the phone. So we call, we try to be really prepared, we try to really know as much as we can about their background, and we try to build a relationship. I, I absolutely detest people just trying to extract information from others. I think you should try and build a reciprocal relationship that will go on for the next 30 years. So the personal interview is really what we try and do, and we narrow it down to people that we think really can give us unique insights. And we also try to learn all about them and their background, where they went to school, and really know the industry and the companies that are in that industry before we call them. So we really try to be prepared. Probably the best uh, analytical quantitative framework, if you will, that I ever saw was in the 1993 Berkshire Annual, and it's enumerated right here. And notice the first three start with the certainty with which. I mean, the reality is if you can do what's on here well, um, you really have everything accomplished. That's really what it's all about. The first 
and, and this applies to us, the certainty with which the long-term economic characteristics of the business can be evaluated. If we look at a business and we have no idea where it's going to be three, four, five, six years from now, and that doesn't mean it won't change, it will change, but if the magnitude of the change is going to be enormous or we can't see it, we won't even go near it. We're done. The analysis is done. The second thing is evaluating management, both in their operating skills and their capital allocation skills, and they're very different skills, and there's very few managers or leaders that are great at both. The third is how shareholder-oriented they are. We view them as our partners. We want them to be highly ethical, um, capable, and talented, but really shareholder-oriented. The fourth is the purchase price, and the fifth is the, the taxation um, and inflation that occurs during your holding period. And so before I, I start the research process, I thought it was interesting, it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about, and just quote a little bit here. I, I took this from my year-end letter um, that I sent to clients. Um, in the 1967 Buffett partnership letter, I mean, it's unbelievable how smart he is. But in the 1967 partnership letter, he talked about quantitative and qualitative. And he said, the evaluation of securities and businesses for investment purposes has always involved a mixture of qualitative and quantitative factors. At the one extreme, the analyst exclusively oriented to qualitative would say, buy the right company with the right prospects and hair and industry conditions, management, and the price will take care of itself. The quantitative spokesman would say, buy at the right price and the company will take care of itself. So he talked about that and he said, although I consider myself to be primarily in the quantitative school, because he's a math genius, the really, and this is really surprising probably to most, the really sensational ideas that I've had over the years have been heavily weighted toward the qualitative side, where I have had a high probability insight. This is what causes the cash register to really sing. However, it's an infrequent occurrence. So the really big money tends to be made by investors who are right on qualitative decisions, but at least in my opinion, the more sure money tends to be made on the obvious quantitative. Well, one of the challenges is the quantitative are so hard to find today. He started with net nets with Ben Graham. It's so, there's so many smart people out there going through the numbers and ripping apart spreadsheets and modeling. It's really hard to find cheap stocks just from a quantitative perspective. And I'm excluding March of 09 and, and other periods like that. So the qualitative, I think, today is much, much more important than it was in the past. And one good example that I talk about at length, I, I, I devoted a couple pages in my letter. Um, valuation is truly an art form and combines a broad range of quantitative and qualitative factors. And one of the things I, 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 I joke about, I was a quarterback in high school. I was nothing like this guy. Um, I wish I was. But um, in the 2000 NFL draft, and this is a really good um, analogy, in the 2000 NFL draft, the NFL scattering report, here is what they wrote about this quarterback. One of the slowest quarterbacks ever timed in the 40-yard dash, very poor vertical jump, lacks great physical stature and strength, lacks mobility and the ability to avoid the rush, system-type player can get exposed to force to ad lib, lacks a strong arm and doesn't throw a really tight spiral, cannot drive the ball downfield, poor build, skinny, gets knocked down early. So that's the analysis. That's what they said. He was rated at a 500 in the 32 years of the NFL combine up to that point. There were 576 quarterbacks evaluated. He was last on the quantitative factors. Now, the quarterback I'm describing is Tom Brady. Um, and whether you like New England or not, he's played in six Super Bowls. He won four of them. He could have lost one or two of them, but he could have won the two he lost. And they easily could have won the other two. And, and they also lost in three F AFC championship games, or he would have been in nine Super Bowls. Now, he was drafted 199th. There were six quarterbacks drafted ahead of him. The point I'm making is that's a wonderful example of how the qualitative factors, if you had studied what he did, he was almost recruited by almost no one. He went to Michigan. He was the seventh or eighth. He switched time with Drew Henson when he was a junior and senior. No one ever had confidence in him. But what happened was because of the ordeals and the way he dealt with things, he developed a unique tenacity, ferocity, and work ethic. And no one really saw that except his head coach. And in fact, even the Patriots, they wouldn't have drafted him 
um, you know, sixth if they thought he was going to be an, a Hall of Famer. So the point I'm making is, at the end of the day, identifying and seeing other things is really becoming more important. The numbers are certainly a starting point, but it's got to go far beyond that. Wanted to briefly talk about the research process. We try to focus on what we deem are the critical issues. We try to find people that are smartest. After we do all the secondary research, when we look at a company in an industry, we say to ourselves, we have no interest in calling 300 people on the phone. We're not doing channel checks. You can hire a kid out of high school to do that. We're trying to find unique strategic insights that make the numbers come to life. Why is this company more profitable? Is that sustainable? What's unique and different about them? What can they do that others can't do? Is it replicable? Um, and on and on and on. And so we try to find thought leaders among customers, competitors, suppliers, and we let them be the conduit through which the smartest provide insights. We really, when we go to an interview, we, we try to really, really be prepared about the company and the industry and about their background. And then we only have two or three themes listed. I mean, I've gone to interviews with, with others where they have a list of like 50 questions. I mean, that's just nonsense. You, you, that's, that's not thinking strategically or clearly. Just have a few key points. You know, why was Progressive's return on equity double everyone else's? And just let them talk. Let them do the work. And they're going to share insights and thoughts, many of which, no matter how much you work you do and how many numbers you look at, you might not have even thought of. You let them do the work and guide and direct. And you're just simply there as kind of like the conductor to bring up key points. In the interview process, again, you want to be honest, prepared, passionate, patient, persistent, creative. Really pre be prepared. I really am prepared, and we are really prepared when we go. We try to create or arouse interest when we make the phone call. We try to gain credibility with them and screen them for their knowledge to make sure it's worth the trip. Um, we try to build relationships. Again, we're not there to extract info. I tell every one of them, first, we don't publish. Secondly, we're using all the information for the benefit of our clients. We don't sell it and never will. Um, and we tell them at the end of our work, they're more than welcome to call us and I'll tell them exactly what we did. Did we buy the stock? Did we not buy the stock? What were we specifically doing, et cetera? Um, and then we set up the personal meeting and that's where we've gotten our best insights. Ken Fisher, um, Phil Fisher's son, um, talked about this in Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, and it's beautifully captured here. The art is to get more questions and the right questions flowing from the answers you receive. People run down a standard question list, which I mentioned earlier, regardless of the responses they get. That isn't art. What questions can best flow from the answer when you can do that well on a real-time basis, you're a creative, investigative investor. So the ability to really sit there and think quickly on your feet and really know what you're talking about is really the key to being a good interviewer. Again, the field research process. Um, you find outstanding managers and leaders, management teams for public and private companies. I give some examples. It augments your existing holdings, and you can also find new investment opportunities among customers, vendors, et cetera, et cetera. Expands your knowledge base in new industries for future ideas, management, et cetera. And I wanted to give just a couple of quick examples, and here are some uh, Freddie Mac, Progressive, Household, United Health, and Zoetis. Again, Freddie. Um, Freddie Mac, as you all well know, Freddie and Fannie, all the issues they had, but back in 1990-91 when I was doing the work, Freddie had a multifamily problem in the southeast. And Freddie basically was a conduit with Fannie to create a secondary mortgage market. And most of what they did was guarantee fee based. They didn't have much of an owned portfolio, whereas Fannie did. But they had a problem in the southeast, so I went down to Atlanta and spent quite a bit of time down there learning and talking to competitors about Freddie. And we were trying to gain an understanding if the multifamily problems were really going to be devastating. And we did that. We talked to former employees, customers. We created a research map. And we did a lot of interviews. And we felt that the losses were under control. Um, and at the end of the day, why is that important? Because Bill Ruane, and I can't take any credit for this, he went in and bought millions of shares after the stock dropped from 90. Now, they, we already owned it, but after it dropped from the 90s into the 30s, he bought tons of stock in the 30s and 40s. 
um, and that was in 1990. Um, and it closed the following year, 91, at like 137. So the point is, being able to do that kind of work to give you insights, and you certainly don't know everything, but doing that kind of work is really an advantage that very few people are going to do. Second one is progressive. Progressive in the early 90s had a 1% market share along with Geico. Um, they were exclusively a non-standard auto insurer at the time, going through independent agents exclusively. It was an extraordinary firm. They made a lot of money. In fact, they had a combined ratio of 82, 83, 84. So they were making 14, 15, 16 dollars in operating income, pre-investment income, um, on an operating basis. It was unheard of. They were really smart. They hired great people. And so we saw the stock go from 47 to 28. And the reason it did, they announced that they were lowering their combined ratio, their operating profit, and raising their combined ratio from 82, 83 to 96. So they were going to reduce their operating profits by two thirds. Moment Wall Street saw that, they sold off the stock. We did a great deal of work. We spent a lot of time in Florida, which was their, the, the largest state and still is. They did a lot of their experiments there. In fact, Glenn, Ren, Glenn Renwick, who became their CEO years ago and just retired July 1st, he was down there in the late 80s, early 90s, practicing their 1-800-AUTO-PRO, which is now their direct business. And so anyway, we spent a lot of time in Florida. Things we did were we interviewed, they hired three MBAs in 1977, Peter Lewis did, and he's the son of the founder. The firm was founded in 1937. Peter joined after he graduated from Princeton in the late 50s, early 60s. Well, in 1977, he sat down with these three MBAs. We interviewed two of them. The third was already the CFO named Chuck Chokel, but the two that we interviewed told us that he told them in 77 he wanted to be a billion dollars in premium revenue by 1990. Well, they beat it by two or three years, and these guys all thought he was crazy because they were doing 45 million, 48 million at the time. But the insights I gleaned from both of them, I spent half a day with both of them in person, they were extraordinary. And they had been gone for years. Um, and so the point is, we were trying to identify what the key issues were. Now, here's what they were. The first was, all their business was non-standard going through non-standard agents. The question was, that business turns quickly. Because if you're paying four, five, six grand a year for insurance, the moment you can get out of there and get into standard or, or, or high quality insurance at much cheaper prices, you do. So you're constantly shopping that. Whereas in standard, I don't even know what we pay. My wife pays the bills. You, you just don't pay attention. So um, at the end of the day, our question was, because that's high turnover, would the existing independent agents move business away from progressive for new clients? Now, why? One, they were lowering their commissions from 15 to 10. Two, they didn't have additional product like homeowners and umbrella to bundle the product, get higher premium, and keep customers' retention longer. Three, they made you spend a lot of money, and a lot of the older agents didn't want to do that. Um, four, they were arrogant. Um, and so, and five, they were going to go into the direct business competing with their agents to create enormous channel conflict. So there were a lot of questions we had, and we went and met with several of the independent non-standard agents. And what we realized was, not from them, but just by being diligent, they couldn't get rid of Progressive. And the reason they couldn't was Progressive was better in pricing and claims than everyone else. So on this high price non-standard product, Progressive was charging 10 to 15% less than everybody else. So if you're an agent and you're not going to write Progressive with a new client, he's going to call the agent across the street from you. And that guy's going to say, well, I'd rather get 10% of five grand rather than nothing. So the fact was they were basically leveraging the agents against each other. And as long as they kept their, as long as they used their operational advantages of pricing and claims, and that 10%, 15%, it has to be 10% or more. If it's 5 or 6%, people don't care as much. But the point was they couldn't get rid of them for that reason. The second reason was there were many risks that they underwrote that no one else would underwrite but Progressive. Um, and the third was Progressive was so technologically good, highly innovative, which is another theme that runs through many of the companies we own. They're highly innovative. If you talk about auto insurance, they're the first to do everything, just like United Health and, and Managed Care. The third was Progressive asked them to make investments in their business, which they did, and you could literally reduce the number of full-time equivalents in your business if you did what Progressive wanted. You know, the doc page, declaration page, lockbox for your money. I mean, there's a whole host of things that they always did. And so because of that, we concluded 
that they couldn't get rid of him, so their predictable, stable business was going to be fine going forward. Then the two other questions were, can they succeed in standard, which was a $100 billion market at the time, where non-standard might have been 15, 18 billion. And then third, can they succeed in direct? And I won't bore you with the details, but we met enough agents and did enough work that we were highly, highly confident that they would. In fact, one agent in Naples, Florida, with five offices, he said, look, Paul, they're arrogant. I'm on their advisory board. They're a pain in the neck. They're going to succeed in both. Claims is the same, and they're going to figure out pricing and standard. And then he said they've been doing all these experiments in direct, um, and at the end of the day, their direct businesses, they're also going to succeed in direct because they really have devoted the time. Now, one of the challenges is it was a mathematically driven culture and not a marketing-driven culture like Geico. And so it took Progressive many years with flow and so forth to become more marketing driven because they were so math driven. But over time they succeeded and today they're number two. Uh, they're the 11th largest in the country. All states number three, Geico's number two, and State Farm's number one in auto. But they've done a great job. And what that research enabled us to do, the field research enables you to do several things. One, it enables you to gain, uh, to prevent permanent capital loss, which is the first point. The second point is it gives you more conviction to make a bigger bet. That can mean instead of making it a 4% position, you start out making it 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, whatever. Now, Bill Ruane at, at Ruane, and I don't do this, Bill loved to start at 10 and 15%. He would only own six or seven stocks. I won't do that. I'm not smart enough. Um, but that's how Bill operated. And so that's another uh, example, progressive. Third one was household. Um, international household, as you all know, was really a consumer finance company. They had two businesses, consumer finance and then credit cards. Credit cards, they had the GM card. And my colleague and I, Andy Nieder, we split the company up and I did all the credit card stuff. So I met with First USA and John Tolleson in Dallas and then Dick Vague in, in, in Wilmington, Delaware, where their operations were and MBNA and Charlie Cawley and Cap One with Nigel Morris and Rich Fairbank, on and on. And then Andy met with a lot of the consumer finance guys. Uh, Norwest Financial, Avco, and others. Now, the bottom line was household had a unique model, which was a little different from Norwest and Beneficial, and they brought in a gentleman uh, from Wells Fargo to run the business. And what they were doing in consumer finance was really trying to automate and do, automate and do centralized credit underwriting, which was different from what Beneficial and Norwest did. And ultimately, you know, we, we didn't know if it would ever succeed, but ultimately it didn't succeed to the degree we would have liked. But one of the benefits of the field research, um, Andy was doing the work on the uh, consumer finance side, and he wanted to go see Norwest Financial in Des Moines run by Dave Wood and Denny Young. And they were earning 8% pre-tax returns on assets, which was by far the best in the industry. So we wanted to go, he wanted to go see him. And he said, you know, Paul, I'm, I, I can't go see him without getting approval from Kovacevic and Les Biller in Minneapolis. So why don't we go to Minneapolis and then you can come with me to Des Moines and, and that's where I grew up and I can show you where I grew up. So I went. And out of that wonderful meeting, you know, 25, 26 years ago, I met Kovacevic. And even today, I think Dick Kovacevic is the smartest banker ever. Um, I mean, that's my opinion. He, he was a genius. Um, and they gave us approval, and we went and met with Norwest Financial. But the point I'm making is, in the process of studying household, um, several other ideas came up. First USA, which I bought personally, and then got bought by Bank One. I don't know, I made three, four, five times my money. That's because I was just so impressed with Tolleson and the people there. Norwest became another holding that we thought was just an incredible company. And Dick would go to Wall Street in the early 90s and talk about talk about branches and stores, talk about cross-selling, and you all, I'm sure, are very well of the issues that have come up with that. Talk about creating a diversified financial services firm. Talk about how he treated his people. He had unique acquisition strategy. He wanted to earn a certain IRR and not have it be diluted for a period of time. He hired really great people and let them run the business. For example, Norwest Financial, when he went in 86 or 87 to take over there, um, Norris was having enormous problems with the Corn Belt and so forth. He totally let them alone. He never interfered. And so he built a great, great institution. Um, he retired, I think, in 08 or 09. He stayed an, uh, an extra year. But the point I'm making is by going out in the field and meeting people, you can find other great ideas and other thought leaders. 
There's a whole list of other company examples, um, and I had mentioned earlier um, United Health was another, and then Zoetis. Um, we did work on United Health back in the early 90s. Um, and to illustrate how unintelligent and downright dumb I am, we did so much work in the managed care space, and you always worry about the government gorilla. I mean, the goal is to go to single payer, and that's been the case for 30 years. But the point is, we interviewed with Foundation Health in Sacramento, and Len Schaefer at WellPoint in LA, and Len Abramson at US Healthcare in Philly, and many others. And then we went to Minneapolis, which was one of the highest penetrated HMO markets in the, at the time. And we also met with George Halverson, who was at Health Partners, who later became the head of Kaiser, which is another advantage to meeting people and building relationships. But we met Bill McGuire, and to this day, outside of Jack Schuler, who got fired from Abbott in August of 89, and then they realized they made a mistake and fired Shellhorn in December of 89, Bill's probably the smartest healthcare executive I ever met. And I was too dumb to realize it was all visible. All the other HMOs thought like actuaries. How can we make money? Let's price the product like an actuary. Bill was a, a physician by training. He's about 6'8", and they got him when they bought Peak Health in Colorado in the late 80s. But Bill would look at healthcare needs and build businesses around them. And he created what today are the three Optum businesses at United. Those three businesses are worth a fortune. Um, had you bought United back when I met him, and, and the point I'm making is, that was different than everyone else. No one thought like him. And I was too young and stupid to realize it then. Now, we corrected that, um, and we bought it a few years later. But the point is, those three Optum businesses today, give you an example, I did a presentation three years ago in January of 13 when Obamacare was coming out. United, at the time, had those three Optum businesses in, as opposed, in addition to their commercial health care and all the rest, Medicare, Medicaid. Well, they're the most innovative company in the industry. They have geographic diversity. They have product diversity. They're number one in almost every business segment they're in. But then they have these jewels called Optum. And let me give you one example. One of the businesses is called Optum Insight, the old Ingenix. They do five, six billion in revenue. They're the best data analytics company in healthcare, and I got that verified by many competitors. And they do 20% margins. So it's the least regulated, it's one of the most profitable, and businesses like that sell for two, three, four, five, six times revenues. So back in January of 13, because of Obamacare, the stock was 52, or a billion shares out. So you're paying 52 billion in equity cap to buy it. Those Optum businesses alone, if you added them all up and sold their PBM, Optum RX, and then the Optum behavioral business, those businesses alone were probably not worth much less than that. So you were getting all the other businesses for free. Um, and they made stipulations on what they thought, bless you, they made stipulations on what they thought Optum can do. Well, it was clear to us that Optum could probably significantly exceed those, and they did. And we've been very lucky the stock's 140, 150, 142, 143. But there's an example of they were different. What they were doing was unique and different from all the other. And by going out in the field and meeting people, it was so visible. And if I wasn't as dumb as I am, I would have been able to really capture that um, and exercise the purchase of it. And then the final one is Zoetis. Um, I've been following animal health forever. Um, Merck, Eli Lilly, Novartis, many of the companies own animal health companies. And it was very hard when they were embedded in these large public companies to really learn how good a business they were. Well, Pfizer spun out Zoetis a few years ago. And it's, a, it's just a great business. And a couple things that were unique about Zoetis. One, that enormous cost-saving capabilities because they were embedded within Pfizer. Um, so they could close a lot of manufacturing facilities and so forth. So there were huge cost savings available to them, particularly after they installed SAP uh, or Oracle. I think they did SAP um, where they had to spend a lot of money because they were using Pfizer, uh, Pfizer I I IT. But enormous cost synergies, one. Two, 65, and they were about $4 billion in revenue. 65% of the business was livestock. 
35% was companion. Well, my hope is that they keep growing companion because it's a bunch more profitable than livestock. However, livestock is still well positioned because the, the, the emerging world needs and wants more and more protein, which helps their livestock business. Second, the companion animal business will keep growing because middle, middle classes in India, China, and elsewhere, um, and the growing single population globally, um, as people do better financially, they have more pets. So that's another. A third is they're the, by far the most innovative R&D in that industry. 20 to 25% of every vaccine and 20 to 25% of every drug um, through, and there, there are various regulatory agencies that, that, that do, that, do that, they're different, have come from Zoetis. So they have a phenomenally innovative and creative lab. Thir another advantage, they had six, seven, eight thousand sales reps going out dealing with veterinarians and, and, and farms that are doing livestock. It's very hard to replicate that. It's not like having a PBM where they just make the decision for you and having sales reps doesn't matter. Another advantage um, that they have is in that business, most of their drugs are off patent. There's no generic behemoth that goes after them. So many of the drugs that they have have been off patent for 10 years, and they're charging double or triple the price they did 10 years earlier. So you don't have to worry about generic competition. Another benefit is once you develop a drug uh, in that space, you can extend it globally geographically and by product. So it can be in pill form, it can be injectable, it can be in liquid form, and then you can also distribute it in many cases across the livestock uh, universe and across the companion animal universe. I mean, it's just an extraordinary business. Um, and so it came public um, and it was public for about a year till Pfizer got, they had 500 million shares out. Pfizer finally sold the rest of theirs about a year later. Um, and the stock got hit then. It got hot into the high 30s, and then it went under 30, and that's when we bought it. Um, it's 50 now, but it's expensive. But the point I'm making is we went out into the field, talked to veterinarians, talked to some thought leaders to confirm our hypotheses, um, and that's another example um, of, of going out in the field and finding a company that was truly unique uh, or different. So that's pretty much it. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any thoughts or questions you may have. In my, in my experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the list of, of mistakes is, you know, we'd be here all week. Um, but my biggest mistakes or our firm's biggest mistakes have not been mistakes of commission, which I have plenty. They've really been mistakes of omission. Um, and so the commission, um, one example is Mattel. Um, Jill Barad had built the Barbie brand, um, and she was a great product manager. She built the brand globally. She did a great job. And then they made her CEO. And she bought a thing called, um, and the stock went from the mid-40s to the low 20s, and I was all over it in the low 20s. They were doing about $4.5 billion in revenue. I won't bore you with all the segments. But the point is, Barbie was close to a couple billion, and they had Fisher Price, and they had the Matchbox, and, and, and the other car business, Hot Wheels. But the point is, she bought the learning company and paid four times revenues. She paid $3.6 billion for a company with $800 million in revenue run by two entrepreneurs. She didn't, and the team, not to just blame her, everyone, they didn't understand what they were buying. Retailers could give back the merchandise if it didn't sold, sell. They bought a company with no IT, no infrastructure. Um, when Bob Eckert took over, who's a brilliant executive, when he took over, they sold it for $1 to the Gore companies. So she wiped out $3.6 billion. Now what happened for us is the stock went to nine, but we never gained the conviction. And while we ended up selling it several years later for 27 or 28, the reality is it was just a terrible run for our clients. Um, I mean, it wasn't devastating, but it was just terrible. We, that money could have been elsewhere. So that was one mistake of commission. Harsco was another. But the biggest mistakes have been mistakes of omission, which are really depressing. depressing. A great one was I went to the Gabelli Automotive Aftermarket Conference in Vegas, which I'd go to every year, and I met the people running O'Reilly. Family, 50% was uh, do it for me, 50% was do it yourself. Um, just a great company, my kind of people. Um, I met the CEO, I did the work, and then for whatever reason, because I'm dumb, I didn't buy it and it was 30. I don't know, I think it hit close to 300. 
Um, and, and so I don't, it doesn't really bother me when I see stocks that I haven't done the work on go up five or 10, I, I could care less. But there are times when you've done the work. O'Reilly's an example, two others are TJX and Thor. TJX and Thor are very small positions in our portfolios. I was just too dumb to make them bigger positions. I saw the competitive advantages, but I just didn't fully understand them, and for whatever reason, I didn't pull the trigger.